Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Today's a special day for us because we are turning our attention in the month of November to the spiritual discipline of being thankful. And how can being something be a spiritual discipline? Well, a discipline actually requires you to do certain things. And so we're going to talk about what are some of the things that we can do to cultivate thankfulness in ourselves. And today we are starting off by having a feast of Thanksgiving, and uh, we're going to have a wonderful meal. Uh, many of you have brought side dishes, and our kitchen manager, who helps us with our community dinner program, Hannah Faye, is down in the kitchen right now making our main entree. So um, right after worship is over, people will be ferrying their things out of refrigerators and warmers and putting them up on these blue tables that are right over here. And you'll notice in the back, there are tables set up that have place settings already on them, so you don't have to juggle your silverware and your plate and your glass. That's all back there. Um, so just go and choose a table, grab a plate, and when everything is ready, um, be able to come over, back over here and fill up your plates. It's also what we're calling Staff Appreciation Day. Uh, we want to be able to say in person our thanks to those who are constantly um, keeping the ministries of Union Place going. And so there'll be a time in the service where I'm hoping that Jess Dager and Hannah can come up from the kitchen and be up here along with the rest of our staff um, to be recognized and thanked. But we're glad that you are here. And it's a wonderful time to recall that great hymn, Come Ye Thankful People Come. And throughout this month, that's who we will strive to be. So welcome to worship.
when you join me in a call to worship. Get praise of servant of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord from this time on and forevermore. From the rises of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to praise. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who look far down from the heaven, the earth? Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. Let us pray. God, our prayer, your gifts to us are countless, your goodness knows no limit. We are come today with hearts full of thanksgiving. In this time of worship, teach us to us with lives that gives. You have given. We are honored by you. Trust in us for to care for teach. As receive reverence before you as we fulfill our great obligations as stewards of your creation. Grant us hearts that know the needs for of others that we may never take more than our shares of this life we have received from you. In Jesus' name we pray. When we sing this bell, there's a word, peace, that uses part of that same sign. You want to learn a new sign today before we get started? And I want all of the adults out there to try to learn this too. If we do something like, we'll take your hands like this, and we put them like this, and then switch them. Okay, like that, 
That's changing something. And this is being still and quiet. So when we want to wish someone peace, we go, that's peace. The changing to being still and quiet. Can everybody do that together? This, this, and this. That's peace. And then you can go like this, and that's to be with. And if we put our hands out like that, it's you. So if we do this all together, we go, peace be with you. And then if you want to say, hey, you too, you go like this. And that's, and also with you. So now we can all greet each other. I want all the grown-ups to stand up and face other people so that you can see each other. And now we're all going to wish each other, and here in our circle, we'll do the same thing. Let's wish each other peace be with you. And then we're all saying to each other, that's all saying to each other. Very good. All right. And, and you can all sit down now. And now we know a new way to greet each other at church. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You have with us today up front the desert box. Okay, let's all stay on our stay on our places. Okay, can everybody sit on your spot? All right. This will be a chance to touch in a minute. <laughs> This is the desert box. So many important things happen in the desert that we just have to have a piece of it in our worship space so that we can learn all of the stories of God that happen here in the desert. The desert is a strange and wild place. At night, it's so cold. And in the daytime, the sand God loves us so much that God gave us the 10 best ways to live. And the people of God loved those 10 best ways to live so much that they wanted to carry them with them everywhere they went. And so they made a special place called the ark so that they could carry them with them everywhere they went when they were out in the desert. They even made a tent for God called the Tabernacle. And they put the ark in there, the ten best ways to live. And at last, God led them through the desert and across the river to the promised land. And they took the ark with them. But when they got here, there were other people here that didn't want them to be there. And there was war and there was fighting. And in some of those wars, they lost the ark. After a very long, long time, one of the people of God named King David captured an area called Jerusalem. They were home. And the people of God came into that area of Jerusalem and they were happy to be there. And David built for himself a house, a palace, a beautiful place that he could live. And then David found the ark and brought it back. And David thought to himself, I live in a beautiful house. But the Ark of God is still living in a little tent. I'm going to make for God a house of God. And God said, no, you're not. Your son Solomon is going to make that house. And so, that's what happened. It took many, many people. Build the 
special house for God. Put big pillars on it. Strong walls. And they took all of these things that belonged to the temple, all the things that they had had in the special tent. They brought them all into God's new house. In the Holy of Holies, they put the ark. I wonder if I went to Jerusalem today, I wouldn't be able to see the temple because there was more brighter and it's gone. And I wouldn't be able to see the Ark of the Covenant because it got lost in history. But it's okay because everywhere that people still love the ten best ways to live, they make a holy place for God. So we can make a holy place right now in our own hearts. And we can make holy buildings where we come to say thank you to God. So I'm going to invite you right now, after we wonder for a little bit, to think about what you might make for God as a place. And there's some papers and other things. Right now, I'm wondering, I wonder how those people felt when they came into the beautiful place they built for God. And I wonder how they felt when they were wandering in the desert carrying the ark with them. And I wonder how God feels when we come into a holy place and say, thank you, God, for all of these things you've given me. Mm -hmm, it does. If you want to touch the sand, I'm going to ask each of you to come forward. And I've got a tray already made up for you so that you can take this back to your seat with your family. And there's a glue stick if you want to glue paper onto a paper to make some kind of a temple or house. And there's crayons if you want to draw. And I'm going to ask you to come back at the end of our time together so that you can tell me about what you made and what you thought as you remembered the story. Good job, Mateo.
from Sol 95126. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. From the Lord is a great God and a great ruler above all gods. And our God's hands are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains. The sea too, for God made it. In the dry land which our creator's hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our makers. Hello. Oh, that's my one. Hi. This is Sam upstairs again. Uh, giving a quick campus connector update for you all today because it is a uh, busy service. But um, this week I was really struck um, by a moment that happened today, at, or not today, but earlier this week, at Project for Less. Um, it's a meal we offer on Thursdays, and uh, we just give out these nice meals that are prepackaged by the University of Illinois. Um, for us and another RSO brings them by and I had a group of students who came out um, and joined in with uh, giving the food out to others and also with playing um, board games and card games and stuff like that that we uh, that we always do at our P4L meal and uh, a couple of the students at a certain point during the games we were deep into a NPR mind puzzle game um, and people were sitting there like, oh, my head's exploding. Um, and, uh, but as we were going through, one of the, one of the people just sat for was like, you know, we don't, we don't get this all that much in college, just a chance to think for fun. Um, and he was like, this is really fun. You guys do this every week? And I was like, yeah, this is every week. Um, and there was a lot of excitement in that uh, because he was like, yeah, me and my friends, we're, uh, we're going to be back here next week. <laughs> so it was just really fun to build some community with random new people from the school. Um, and I've, I've been really excited that um, opportunities like Project for Less have allowed that to happen while we also serve our community handing out food. Um, so yeah, things are going things are going well on the, on the campus world. All right, back to your service. <laughs>
in the room at the moment, but for those who are, um, I'm going to ask them to come forward. Walter and Jesse and Sarah and Samir. Sam, if you can come down, come down. <laughs> Jesse, Anna, Anna. Uh, and Christina. Um, Hannah and Jess are still in the kitchen, so we will thank them when they bring up the food, I guess. But I just want to say a little bit about each one of you that are here right now um, and express our appreciation because it has meant so much to us that we have people that are here all throughout the week taking care of things so that when we come together on Sunday, we can hear the good news of the ministry that is being done throughout the week. And um, we know that we have a place where we can worship God and also a place where we can serve God uh, throughout the entire week. So I'm going to start with Jesse. Um, I'm going to just give you a basic on Jesse. Jesse, I think, is the most chivalrous person I have ever met. Um, I don't think there has been a time where he has been anywhere near that he has seen me carrying a box of compost out to my car or trying to roll a table down the aisle. And he hasn't said, Pastor Chris, don't you go doing that, and uh, comes over and tries to help. And that is just the spirit of this man. He is a giver and a carer. Um, and, and he works also for Dream and for a couple other churches. So the amount that he gets done for us in the time that we have um, is astounding. So for all of the ways that you keep our building clean and ready and you help us with so many things, um, we just want to express our appreciation today. And Walter, well, if you know Walter, you know that Walter does not just fix things. He does hang ceiling lights for us and uh, change light bulbs and scrape plaster and scrape and repaint railings. And um, every time you say, hey, this is broken, you know, Walter is the person that we end up going to. But I want to tell you another side of Walter. Walter is a deep man of God and a man of faith. And I cannot tell you the number of times where I have overheard him while I'm wondering, I thought he was upstairs working on that light, and he's down in the hallway just outside my office and he'll be having a conversation uh, with somebody who's really hurting, and he'll be praying with them, and he'll be um, encouraging them, and letting them know that they are seen and that what is happening to them matters to the church and matters to him. And so, Walter, for all of those things that you have done to keep our mission outpost running in the building, and for all the ways you make our mission about people, we want to thank you. <laughs> Sarah's official title on staff is staff musician, because we didn't know how we would name what she does. Uh, she does so many things. You have seen Sarah lead a little group of chimers. Um, you have seen her play her flute. You have seen her um, help us out with singing. You have seen her do sectionals at the choir. And in so many ways, she is our go-to person to help us keep our music lively and beautiful. And not only that, she has a tremendous gift for in worship planning, thinking ahead to things that we might do to enrich the service. And I want to thank you, Sarah, for all that you've had. <laughs> and Christina, I am going to give you Hannah and Jess's cards because Christina's my go-to person throughout the week um, when I need some administrative support and some help. And for all of you, she's the one that got us back to having bulletins again, <laughs> and that tries to make sure that everything is taken care of on time with paying our bills, doing our church finances, answering the phones, answering the door. And for all of those interruptions, I just want you to know that the church admin is wearing not three, four, or 10 hats, but about 127. And so it's really hard to have a job where you're a part-time employee and you're supposed to jump from QuickBooks 
to an accounting software in another way and run to the bookkeeper and come back and answer the door and hand out groceries and all of the things that she does. She does it with grace and she's constantly learning and has a hunger to help us be better. And so thank you, Christine. Well, Samir has been on staff twice as long as I have, and then some. Um, but he has, he has been here with all of this immense talent, and not just raw talent and musical skill and ability, but with a real passion for helping others to be engaged in music. And for the ways that you have led our choir, for the ways that throughout this pandemic you have managed when we can't have a choral program to continue to bring us outstanding music for all of those crazy timed rehearsals at 11 o'clock at night in the sanctuary because that's when the person was available to rehearse. Um, I just give you thanks for all you give to us. from Sam upstairs. Uh, he also wears a lot of different hats. Um, as a campus connector, he is working with those in the college, um, uh, at, well, different colleges of the university, helping students to do short-term um, internships, helping students to fulfill class requirements by connecting them with meaningful work that helps make our community better. And so we give thanks for the way that you have a listening ear for students who just need somebody to talk to, for the ways that you have stimulated conversations with book groups and other ways of, of bringing people on board, but for your creativity and all that you have been doing for us to expand our reach into the university, we give you thanks, Sam. for all of them as they go back to their seats. We are very, very grateful. Will you join me now in a prayer? Oh Lord, we come to you today bringing all that we have, our lives, our hopes and dreams, our fears, and sorrows. We place these before you in faith and hope, knowing that no matter what has happened, you are with us and blessing us. Open our hearts to receive your words and your spirit that we may find healing and comfort. Open our lives to the wondrous possibilities for service and joy that you offer. Ease our minds that we may hear words of encouragement and peace today. You know, O oh God, that we often look at ourselves, our gifts, and our talents, and wonder what you could possibly do with these offerings. We don't think that we have much to give. So far too many times we belittle the gifts you provide and miss the joyous opportunity to make a difference in the lives of others. Free us from our fears of not enough and help us to joyfully place our hopes, dreams, and lives in your care. Today, O oh God, make us truly thankful for the abundance of gifts we do have. Inspire us to share generously, multiplying the thanks we feel ourselves, to include the thanks felt by those who receive the gifts we share. We come as your thankful people, offering our praise to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. chapter of the book of Matthew, but there is purpose in hearing it in context. 
starting with Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, only to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, in order that they might be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that what you give may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because they have so many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. This, then, is how you should be praying. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show everyone they are fasting. And truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not much more valuable than they? And any one of you, by worrying, Add a single hour to your life. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like none of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, here today and gone tomorrow, will he not much more clothe you, will you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what will we eat, and what will we drink, and what will we wear? For the pagans run after those things. And your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first God's kingdom, and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day's trouble is enough for the day. May God bless the reading of the gospel. What are you looking for? I asked my husband, Ed, who stood holding the refrigerator door open, scanning its overfull shelves. Sour cream. I need it for this recipe I'm making. I stepped over to the fridge, slid a few jars to the side, and pulled out the elusive container. Maybe this scene has played out in your household before. You know what you want, you're actively looking for it, but even though it's right in front of your face, easily within reach, you just can't attain it. 
When it comes to refrigerator management, the descriptor overfull explains a lot. It's easier to see what we have when we don't have so much that we can't easily find our way to what we need right now. It's true about more than our refrigerators or our overstuffed garages or our cluttered homes, isn't it? Sometimes the very reason that we feel unfulfilled and can't find what we are so desperately seeking is because it is buried under an overabundance, the burden of just too much. Savvy parents know this about keeping children engaged and exploring the world so that they might learn and grow and flourish. A small number of playthings appropriately selected for the child's present age and abilities. Keep a child playing independently much longer than an overstimulating room crammed with dozens and dozens of bright distractions which are pulled out, tossed aside, and sequentially replaced with a new thing, one after another. But in just minutes, the room is in complete disarray. The child is whining. None of these things are what she wants to play with. Judging by our overfull refrigerators and disorganized garages and bulging closet, this malaise of discontent is rarely outgrown. There's a scene in Disney's 1964 film, Mary Poppins, where the children have just met their new nanny and she finds the nursery in complete disarray with abundance everywhere. She makes tidying up a game and the kids have so much fun cleaning up that they want to stay and play that game again. Enough is as good as a feast, the sassy nanny tells them as she bundles them out the door and off to a new adventure. We live under the thrall of superlatives, where good and enough are words that seem somehow less than, best, and too much. Whether it's too much sugar and salt, or supersized lattes and sodas, or the latest and greatest phones and tablets, we miss out on gratitude for the common experience of good enough as we chase after something new, another distraction, something tastier, shinier, more advanced. In that long gospel reading for today, Jesus lands squarely on the side of Mary Poppins, Enough is as good as a feast. We might even say enough is better than a feast. Imagine a world where children are given another new trick-or-treat sack full of candy every day of the year and allowed to gorge themselves on its contents whenever they please. We all know that's not really loving parenting. In the same way, our heavenly parent knows that it will not make us well or fill us with the experience of shalom, peace, being with us. If we just get everything we want when we want it and how we want it delivered all the time. Our culture, however, is preaching a very different version of prosperity from what scripture supports. I have heard dozens of people in the last few months complaining about complaining. I also have been complaining about complaining. Do you know what I mean? You've seen it on the news where out of control airline passengers have berated and even physically assaulted flight attendants because they wouldn't let them do what they wanted when they wanted how they wanted to do it during a flight. You've seen it at a restaurant or a grocery store or someone in the line in front of you or the table next to you is rudely complaining to their server or cashier that their wait was too long, their business is understaffed, the selection of items is not up to their expectations, and they have felt like they did not receive the personal attention which they have come to expect. If you are a teacher or a nurse, or a CNA in a care facility. You have felt this in your very muscles and bones at the end of a workday. 
Professionals in almost every field are reporting that they are drowning in a tsunami of complaining, criticism, personal attacks, and even verbal abuse. A friend who owns a small personal care business made a plea this week on social media for the public to immediately cease and desist. She posted, people aren't being paid enough to deal with the increasing hostility from customers. It's really sad when I see a business has to post on social media or send out an email to their customer base reiterating, be nice to our staff. Grown adults shouldn't need to be told how to be nice. What do you suppose is causing this? And what is the Christian response to its prevalence in our communities in this year, 2021? If we take seriously the teachings of Jesus, we find a good starting place to fix what ails us. I read that whole chapter from Matthew because Jesus has already put together the best sermon on this. I could have just read it and stopped, but you know, me. Our malaise of discontent is the source of so much harm to ourselves as well as to others. Why do you worry about what you will eat or drink or wear? Seriously though, if Panera is out of your favorite soup, choose another one or have a sandwich. Your day cannot be ruined by such a minor disappointment, but it can be ruined for you and for someone else by your ill-considered response to it. Well, if you're like me, you like to fix things, especially if there's a quick fix that requires very little work on my part. And in that spirit, I offer one little suggestion. It's quick, but it can easily and quickly pay dividends. Tie something around your wrist <laughs> that will remind you every time you see it through the day that you are a person blessed with gifts and need to be thankful. And every time you see it, seize the opportunity to express your appreciation to someone else. Also, every time you start to complain or criticize and you see it, I made mine sparkle, so I would be sure to notice it. When you find yourself ready to criticize and complain, ask yourself, will the world end if you keep that to yourself this time? I'm not saying you can never again in this lifetime offer advice and counsel to those whose lives you are sure you can improve. I'm only suggesting a religious fast. As a spiritual practice, fasting is the intentional choice to give something up for an appointed period of time. Can we all go a week or 10 days without critiquing, complaining, and criticizing? Like I said, this sort of just do it activity is just a quick fix. It's time limited. It's a temporary little experiment. The real work that is needed is a lifetime pursuit. And like a precious jewel, that holy work has many facets. In a small group study this week, my husband Ed shared insights about what some authors have called the kingdom of noise in contrast to the kingdom of God or we might say in contrast to living within the realm of what is holy. The kingdom of noise is what the rulers of this present age promote. The kingdom of noise makes it so that you can never get quiet enough to simply sit with your own thoughts and feelings. In the kingdom of noise, you can never turn off the buzzing notifications from your phone or the pulsing lights of the many screens that follow you throughout your day. In the kingdom of noise, competing voices blare their messages at one another about opposing political ideologies and social norms and identity platforms. Everyone is talking so loudly and no one is listening. Routinely fasting 
from the kingdom of noise is a worthwhile pursuit that does not promise any quick fixes, but opens up space in routine silences for the voice of God to redirect our attention. In the realm of the holy, the kingdom of God, which Jesus speaks about so often in every one of the four Gospels, the constant harassment of the kingdom of noise is hushed. The incessant voices barking at us, buy this, you're not good enough, you deserve more, they are the problem, that's not fair to me, are put in their place. The sixth chapter of Matthew begins with a warning. Be careful about trying to impress others with how righteous and holy you are. It moves on quickly to further admonitions, which are part of that multifaceted gem of spiritual growth which Jesus desires for every one of us to possess. Pray in your closet, not on the street corner. Be privately generous rather than seeking attention for your big donations. Pray for God's will, not your will. Ask for daily bread, not a lifetime supply of porterhouse steaks. Ask for forgiveness. Forgive others. Normalize fasting. Yes, that means denying yourself what you want. As one of your quiet life routines. Don't get hung up in the pursuit of worldly wealth. Don't worry. And let today's issues be enough to tackle today. Whew. That's going to take more than one shiny ribbon on my wrist or one week. It is going to take a lifetime. Within this tightly packed chapter of Matthew, there is a precious promise tied to the best advice in Jesus' sermon. Strive first for the kingdom of God and God's own righteousness and then the promise and all these things you've been worrying about will take care of themselves. So at the risk of publicizing that fast that I am undertaking, I've got a ribbon on my wrist to remind me, one, to stop complaining, even to stop complaining about other people complaining, and two, to seek the realm of the holy, the kingdom of God, as I fast regularly from the kingdom of noise, which leads to so much discontent. In the words of Psalm 95, which Luce gave us this morning, I will come before the Lord with thanksgiving and extol God's kingdom in music and song. May it be so for all of us. Amen. As we begin our stewardship campaign, it is again time for each of us to consider what so many of you consider all year. What can we do 
to continue to make Uni Place a welcoming and contributing force in our community. Looking out at so many of you, I realize that I am preaching to the choir. Many of you do so much already. But sometimes some of us, including me, need to venture outside of our comfort zones. About 20 years ago, give or take, we made structural changes to this building. We added an elevator, we reconfigured the entryway from the parking lot, we reconfigured a portion of this level. Also, as with so many other buildings in this town, we found that we had asbestos in the floor tiles on this level and downstairs. At that time, Rick Royals gave many hours of his time to oversee these projects. He determined that asbestos removal by a professional company was way too expensive and beyond our reach. He asked Charles Graves and me if we would take the classes and sessions to learn how to remove asbestos, and then, of course, we would have to pass the state-mandated exams to become eligible. Charles immediately said yes. Over a few beers with Rick, or was it more? And my wife surging, I also said yes. Now, I am not even close to being a handyman. Charles and I took a few trips to Bloomington, Illinois to learn how to use the machines and pass the exams. We were certified by the state as asbestos removers for one year. Charles and I both had pickup trucks, so we were able to rent the necessary machines, etc., and bring them to our church. Clyde Smith took lots of pictures, even some when the state inspectors made an unannounced visit to see if Charles and I were legal. I'm pretty sure we were. Not only did I form a bond with Mr. Graves, he asked me to please call him Chuck, but I began to help him mow the lawn here at church. At that time, we managed the entire building, and mowing for one person was a major undertaking. That Springfield Avenue side, which is, I think, mostly on a 45 degree angle, was a killer. Chuck started doing this so that we wouldn't have to pay a service to do it. I have continued in that manner with help from my grandsons, currently it's Malachi, who many of you know, their friends, and waiting in the wings are my great-grandsons, a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old who can't wait for their turn. By the way, I, I pay Malachi's friends. But for that, I'm hoping to teach them about stewardship and, of course, be another adult in their lives. So you never know how you might be a steward. There are many ways to do something. According to Leslie Nielsen, there's doing something, and much more difficult, there's doing nothing. Because when you're doing nothing, you never know when you are finished. <laughs> As I did, it's okay to take a risk. As I know you will, think about what you want to continue doing and whether or not you wish to take on a new challenge to take a risk. From Neil Simon, and I've said this to some of you before, if no one ever took risks, Michelangelo would have painted the Sistine floor. Amen. Thank you, Fred. I'd invite the kids to bring back 
um, their praise and share with us their reflections on the story. Everybody knows how to get in and how to get out. Really beautiful. Thank you for that. That's so lovely. What did you do, Timothy? Oh, he did a 3D house. Oh, he's got an entrance over here for his 3D house for God. It does look like that was hard. You worked very hard. That's beautiful, Claire. Tell me about it. Is it a house? And is this one a house for people or a house where people go to talk about God? Or what kind of house is it? It's an everyone's house. Oh, I love that, Claire. I know how much you always welcome other people. Thank you for making a house that's for everyone. Very nice. That's great, isn't it? <laughs> and Matteo. Mateo made a really fun house. I like that. Beautiful job. Look at all these lovely houses for God. This is Mateo. He's our littlest guy. And by the way, if you haven't heard the good news yet, Mateo is going to have a sibling in May. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you all for the things that you made, and most of all, for your interest in the stories of God. And when we're having our meal, if you want to have a time to come up and to touch and to look at more closely the sand and the temple, you can come up and do that later today. Let's say a prayer with one another before we go back, and it's going to be time for the Feast of God. Gracious God, we thank you for bringing us into this beautiful house that was built in your honor. We thank you for the people that helped to take care of it, and we thank you for the people who come here to pray and give thanks. And we thank you for the meal we're about to enjoy. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you all very much. If you want to take your pictures home, you can take them, and if you want to leave them here, your structure home. Exactly. Timothy has a structure, not a picture. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you all. You're going to take this one? Good idea. Good idea. You did a wonderful job. All right. You want to go over to the for those of you that are sitting in pews, you'll see how Timothy and Claire are showing us what they do every time at Worship and Wonder. When they finish their reflection time, they put everything away. They do a beautiful job. And I think they do it at home, too. Good job, Caleb. <laughs> yeah, you did so good, baby. It is now time for us to be called to the Lord's table, and so you are invited. If you did not receive a little kit for communion, there are still some up here on this little table. And we partake of the grape and the cracker together um, after the elders' prayer.
lift up the moment we pray. Precious Lord, we give you what we have and what we are to you. And we trust you will bless these gifts and these givers into what you will have us become. Amen. And now as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are grateful especially in this season of thanksgiving, Lord, for the bounty that you have provided to us, for the bread that nourishes our inner need, and the cup that reminds us of Jesus and his presence. We give thanks as we eat and drink here at the Lord's table. Amen. On the very night he was betrayed, Jesus sat at the table together with his disciples. And during the supper he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Likewise, taking the cup, he said, Drink of this, all of you, for this cup is a new covenant, poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you eat and drink, do this and remember me. tables to roll outside for those who would prefer to eat out of doors um, and then there are tables that are set up out here so please go ahead and pick a place uh, and then as soon as those of you who brought things to share have them all laid out on the blue table here we'll uh, make an announcement that we're ready to eat and uh, hopefully we'll have Hannah and Jess upstairs so that we can thank them for all they've been doing for us while we have been up here worshiping go now with the love of God be blessed and be a blessing. Know that we are all gifted and called to give. In the name of Christ, amen. Mm -hmm. 